Dasha Burns was there as well, our colleague at the rally on Saturday, standing in the press area near the former president. Dasha, good morning. Tell us what you saw last night. Yeah, Willie Savannah, good morning. You know, we've all covered shootings as part of this job. It's unfortunately become something familiar. We race to the scene of the tragedy in the aftermath. What's less familiar is actually witnessing the moments of tragedy firsthand. And, and Willie Savannah, that's what my team and I experienced last night. We were on the press risers, which were positioned in the center of the venue, as usual, just behind the seated section of the audience. We were just finishing up filming a stand-up as the former president began his speech again, like usual. My producer, Bianca, and I started to walk down the stairs to grab uh, our laptops when suddenly we heard that sound that you now hear in, in the video we played over and over again, that those loud cracking pops. We, like many that we interviewed afterwards, we initially thought it might be fireworks. You know, sometimes Trump events have pyrotechnics. Uh, but when those sounds kept going and when Mr. Trump stopped speaking, that's when Bianca and I took cover behind some stage equipment, initially thinking just as a precaution, right? Uh, and we experienced that rapid roller coaster of emotion alongside the crowd. It was, went from being a standard political event, people were cheering, buying merchandise and food, people were dancing, to YMCA, the song that usually comes on just before the former president makes his entrance. Then it transitioned to confusion and chaos as those shots rang out, people trying to figure out what that sound was. And then that fear settled in as we realized uh, this could really be gunshots. Uh, we were taking cover, Bianca and I, when, when we heard those cheers from the crowd as the former president raised his fist in the air with blood on his face and was taken to safety by Secret Service. Uh, in those moments, just immediately afterwards, for anyone who wasn't near those who were injured, one ultimately killed, it wasn't immediately clear how dangerous or deadly the situation was. Some in the crowd began to leave the scene, but others did stick around. We got back up on the press riser. We reunited with our crew, who was thankfully safe, and we began reporting live until ultimately we were told in the middle of one of our live reports, as Secret Service told us that this was now an active crime scene, we were told to leave immediately. Our crew had to abandon most of their gear. We made our way uh, to the parking lot where thousands of cars would ultimately take hours uh, to get out of that parking lot, Willie. All right, Dasha Burns, who was on the scene at the rally. She's in Butler, Pennsylvania this morning. Dasha, thanks so much. All right, we want to turn now to a witness, Erin Ottenreath. She was also at the rally last night. She joins us on the phone this morning. Erin, good morning to you. Uh, we're glad that you're okay. Can you tell us what you saw, what you heard? Good morning. I was seated in the first row in the middle. I was directly facing President Trump. And... Um, the stage had, the, the photographers were in front of him and they had taken their pictures and they moved them over to his left. And he was speaking and he put a video, not a video, but a picture up and we were looking at the picture. And all of a sudden we heard pop, pop, pop. We all thought it was fireworks. Then I looked at him and he, well, the, the four Secret Service jumped on the stage and pushed him straight down. Then they also pushed on all the photographers that were down there. There was like a pile of them. Nobody was moving for a couple minutes. Then the gentleman came on that had the big guns and the black on. They started saying, clear right, clear left. Okay, on three, stand him up. So one, two, three, they stood him up. He was facing me and he his eyes were bright. I knew that he was okay, but there was a little bit of blood coming here. Then they turned him. He exited the stage down the steps uh, opposite of how he had entered, and that's when I could see the right ear. And I could see the blood from the top to the bottom, but at that point it wasn't gushing. It wasn't as much as by the time he got him to the steps, that picture he had a lot more blood. So that's when the first time we knew that there must have been a shooter. And then they put him into the black sedan and it immediately went off and then they started and the photographers were still in this hump. And I was thinking, man, they must have been shot too. But then little by little, they started lifting them up. Mm. But the, the interesting thing was nobody can it. Nobody ran. Nobody in that first row even took cover. It seemed like everybody was just wanted to protect the president. And I think we all knew that that's what the shooter was after.
Now, I didn't think it was a shooting until I saw the gentleman who had spoken earlier in the day, Rico Elmore, who's from Beaver County on their committee. I saw him exiting down the steps where it was the riser. And I saw he had a white shirt on and down the right side of the shirt was all covered with blood. Now he was walking, so I knew he wasn't shot, but somebody in his vicinity must have been. Yeah. That was the first indication that there was a shooting. So Aaron, um, now that we know the president is injured but safe, the questions are being raised about how this could have happened. And there's been some reporting and some eyewitness accounts that some people in the crowd at the rally last night actually saw this gunman on that structure about 150 yards away. Did you have any sense that there was someone on that building? Did you hear any of those shouts from the crowd? No, I did not, because I was way up front and I was on the ground, you know, I was on the floor level, the, the ground level. I did not hear that. We did see, you know, behind President Trump, there was a, a roof and we did see two sharpshooters on that roof, which I think that I was told that the guy behind me saw him shoot mm. towards that the, the other roof, which was off the fairgrounds. Mm. Uh, and particularly, this was my sixth rally. So by the time I saw them on the roof, I knew that President Trump was coming because the sharpshooters were positioned and they had their but the, the guns were really paint, pointed that way, uh, you know, to that to that side. Aaron, you were um, right there in the front row. I mean, you were just yeah. feet away. I know you I were. Was, I was. The, yeah. I had sent the picture that I had taken from my seat, and there's nobody between me and President Trump. I mean, so you know, and I know you were one of the first people there to get in position for the rally in the morning. I, I, I volunteered. I was there 20 to 7 in the morning. We're showing the picture you took right here. We're actually showing yeah. it on our air. I just wonder how you're doing and what what you make of this. It's just. It's such a, an awful occurrence that you witnessed. And of, of course, we cannot forget a spectator was killed right in that moment. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's hard to explain because you never had it before, you know, that feeling. Yeah. It's almost a little bit like time stopped, you know, until I thought, I mean, when, when he was down underneath the podium, I mean, I really was, I, I, I really didn't know if he was going to ever come back up. That was just, I would just say, like the heartbreaking. That's where my mind was just focused. And I think most of the people in the audience, that's where they were. Because, I mean, abruptly, everything came to a halt. Aaron, I'm curious. And the last person I had seen come onto the stage right before um, President Trump was at Dan Scavino. He was seated to the left of President Trump, closest to him on the floor there. I don't know. I don't think he, I don't know. He must have exited the other way. I never saw that after that. But I remember telling the people I was with that, oh, you know, that was Dan Scafino because I can follow you know, things quite. Yeah, Dan Scavino, an advisor to the former president, a close advisor yeah. to his campaign. So, Aaron, I'm curious how you felt as a supporter of Donald Trump. As you said, you got there early on the front row. When he got up and it became clear that he was safe, injured but safe, and pumped his fist to you all, how did that yeah. make you feel? Uh, I was very relieved because when I saw the blood here, and I saw the blood here, but it was just a little bit, I thought he was injured by being pushed down to the ground. Oh, I didn't mention when he got up, the first thing he said was, they said, you know, lift, and they and he said, I have to get my shoes on. Yeah. Mm. Aaron. So they must have fallen off. And I thought that, that's when I didn't think that he was injured. I thought he got injured just by them pushing him down. That's what and then, then I had no idea that it was a bullet until I saw that gentleman that had the blood on his shirt. That was the first sign. Well, Aaron, you've been through and so it much. Sounded and really you've like, seen so much. Sarah, sorry, what were you going to say? People in the audience were, I mean, on the way out, were saying the fact that it sounded so much like fireworks, it must have been a suppressor on that weapon hmm. a lot from of people that. said that so close to fourth of july that's what it sounded like especially at that and like maybe a neighbor because it was kind of you know there's houses not that far away i thought somebody's having a party hmm. yeah but then it, everything everything just stopped i mean i guess it, i thought it was five minutes into the speech but 
I think now it was 10 minutes into the speech. Well, Aaron, as you said, time stops when you witness something like that. Thank you for your time this morning, for sharing your perspective. We're glad you're okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. Let's bring to the conversation Evie Pomporis. She's a former Secret Service agent. Evie, good morning. Um, I want to put up this map of the, the farm grounds where this event was held last night. So the elevated position where the shooter was set up was about 150 yards from the stage where former President Trump was speaking. As a former Secret Service agent, are you surprised that building wasn't better secured? So when you do a security plan, you've got the the main security, right? The security perimeter where there's the magnetometers, where people are being checked as they're entering the event. You have the outer perimeter where is when you have an open rally like this, you are extremely vulnerable. I've done these. They're probably the most the most anxious you're ever going to be as an agent because you're trying to secure all of it. Now, the adjacent buildings, you do this in urban environments, you do this in a rural environment like this. You, when, when you do a security plan, you literally, literally put yourself on stage and then you look out as if you were the protectee. What can I see? And if I can see it, it can probably see me. Now, at, for an outer perimeter like that, typically you will have a local law enforcement presence. You'll notice those bus buildings. And Secret Service works with local police. You have to think of the Secret Service like they're the conductor of the orchestra. They create the blueprint and design for the security plan. They work with state police. They work with local police. And then they put in resources and assets. So in the typical scenario or the, in, the, in the scenario that one, one wishes would have unfolded, would you have had perhaps a local official, official secure that roof to make sure the roof is clear, make sure nobody's in the building? and then stand guard there so no one comes in after that clearing? So, so we don't know if they did or did not do this. Yes, but they I should have? They, I, would, I would presume you should have a local police presence in that area. Now, could you have put somebody on that rooftop? You could have. The other element is the counter sniper team. So as far as we know, we see a two-man team from the Secret Service side. As we were discussing prior before we started speaking, they are looking at everything. They have to cover 360 degrees. So I know a lot of folks are like, how could they not see this? I think one of the issues is if it is a two-man team, think about what they are consistently covering. So local law enforcement, definitely. But again, we don't know if somebody was or wasn't positioned. Now, if there was no coverage there whatsoever, that's going to be an issue. Why was it, why weren't those adjacent buildings looked like looked at? They are very close. Yes. And if there was somebody stationed there from local law enforcement outside the building where the shooter was, as you consider the possibilities, how could he have gotten up there? So as I look at this, and again, just from a preliminary assessment without having all the details, it seems to me what I would presume before the president goes up on stage, they secure the area, there's communication, essentially, are we good to go? Is he good to get up on stage? I would presume that everything was in the clear. I would think that nobody was on that rooftop. What I suspect, and again, I'm yeah. suspecting that after he got up on stage, that's when the shooter took position. Yeah. There's a little bit of a slant at that rooftop. Also, some of the photos show that he's dressed in colors matching that rooftop and building to a, a camouflage a bit himself. So I'm suspecting he took position after President Trump spoke, then engaged. It's easy in hindsight to say, oh, why wasn't this done or that done? And let's just acknowledge that as we have this conversation. But it, it is interesting because there were eyewitnesses who said they were actually positioned kind of outside the rally, but were just listening, and that they saw the gunman up with the rifle flying around. They were trying to tell some of the local officials that they saw there. Is there a way to communicate? I mean, these are split-second decisions, but for example, if there had been a state police officer outside on that outer perimeter and someone said, there's a guy up there with a the gun, can that message get communicated to Secret Service quickly? Are they all on the same comms? So really what the issue is, that person that was trying to communicate, were they actually verbally speaking to someone or were they trying to get somebody's attention? When you're doing these rallies, you're looking at thousands of people. Yeah. How much law enforcement do you have? Do you have one officer or one law enforcement official to what? A thousand? And are they able to get that person's attention? Guys, at the end of the day, too, and I think this is going to come up during the hearing, resources, money, this mm -hmm. all costs something. So mm -hmm. when you're doing these, when you're doing these security advances, you are negotiating. 
I mean, there are times where I've been, I need 75 agents, and it'll come back. It's like, you know what? We don't have the resources or the funds, or we need these folks to be somewhere else. Can you do it with X amount of people? And it's not just the Secret Service. It's going to be law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Their resources are tapped as well. So, Evie, quickly, let's talk about the aftermath of the shooting. You see the agents rush the stage, keep the former president on the ground, then he stands up. What do you see in those images as he pumps his fist to the crowd, exposes himself again, and then moves toward the car? So if we just break this down as the shooting is happening, we hear the shots being fired. President Trump goes down. He takes cover. And it's also very likely when you look at that banner, there's like this banner around that stage. That tends to be some type of steel that's there by design for an incident like this so that the protectee can hit the ground and take cover. We see the agents come in now from the sides. And their job is that's the shift. That's what's called the shift. They come in and they are the they are the the armor. They're the ones who are re literally, literally going to come around. They're going to secure his body. The goal is now if any additional shots are fired, they take the impact of those shots. They bring him back down. Now you can hear them too. If you're listening to the audio, you can hear them talking on comms. Is it clear? Are we good to go? Because they want to take him from where he's at and they want to move him to the vehicles. You, anytime you're open, and if we look at previous assassinations or assassination attempts, Reagan, JFK, just the most recent ones, always outside, right? Always line aside issues. So they've got them secure. Once they hear the go, you can go. So I'm assuming for them to get the go, somebody probably told them the threat has been neutralized, mm -hmm. right? You're not going to move unless you kind of know what's going on. They pick them up and you can hear the president. It's interesting, just from a human behavior perspective, you hear the president saying, where are my shoes? Where mm -hmm. are my shoes? Mm -hmm. A lot of people are commenting on, is that an odd thing to say? You also have to think about the stress and impact of what Everyone. just happened. Oh, yeah. Shock, yeah. And he's just, you know, it's a kind of like a very human, simple thing to think of. You can hear on the radio, too, that, that they say the shooter is down. You know, so so clearly they felt that the, the threat was neutralized and they could safely move. But as an, as an agent, I mean, the president now with this iconic act of defiance, holding up his fist and literally sticking his neck out into the open again. But if you're an agent right then and there, are you just wishing you could just whisk him off to the car? Well, I saw that and I saw that I can understand why he's doing it from that perspective. But from the other perspective, I'm thinking we know one shooter is down. Right. You don't know if there are other right. shooters. And then the other thing is when you move him to the vehicles, you want to make sure, does he have any other shots within him and check him? Evie, thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, All right, we continue to cover this story. Tom Winter is NBC's investigative correspondent, talking to law enforcement officials throughout the night. So over the night, we did get a, an identity for this mm -hmm. shooter, but it seems at this hour, we don't know a lot about him or his potential motive. Well, that's exactly right. In speaking to those law enforcement officials, some of this country's top uh, intelligence analysts and people that are on top of these type of issues, they say what is very clear this morning is that it is very unclear why this individual did what they did. No apparent criminal history, no apparent history of civil lawsuits for a 20-year-old, an incredible lack of social media presence. There's really nothing that sticks out when you look at him and look at his history and look at his background that would point you to this. He's wearing apparently a Demolition Ranch t-shirt, which is after a YouTube channel, which is very pro-Second Amendment. They fire all sorts of different types of rifles. Uh, he is a registered Republican, as you mentioned at the top of the show and a small donation to a Democratic group. So nothing there points to somebody who would want to show up and try to kill Donald Trump at a rally. And so I think the motive here is going to be very important. It could go two different potentially two different paths. One, some sort of reason that makes sense to nobody else because of a severe mental health breakdown. That is certainly possible. Or the second, was this politically motivated? That could become a big deal. Was Donald Trump not conservative enough for him? Is there some other motivating purpose? And I think that's something that law enforcement is certainly going to pay attention to. We've got two candidates who are going to be crisscrossing this country over the next three to four months. And from a security perspective, that is a nightmare. And societal, for, for, for society, it could become a huge issue, law enforcement uh, officials believe, because if people think that violence is the only way to solve your political viewpoints, 
um, this could be a very rough couple of months or even longer than that. As you say, Tom, we've become accustomed after a shooting almost immediately. You can go to a Facebook page, mm -hmm. some kind of a manifesto, go to Twitter, wherever it is, and find everything you need to know about the shooter. It is striking that there's no trace, at least for now, no footprint on social media. So where will investigators look next for motive? Well, that's what's going to be so key about this FBI investigation. I mean, they're asking for the public's help, but they're also going to go through every single email account he's ever thought about having. They're going to go through uh, all of his phones, all of his devices. What does he have on his person, hard drives that could be at the home? In past incidents of, of mass violence or these types of shootings, those have been uh, potentially very helpful avenues. And then, of course, there'll be a complete security review of what happened here and obviously the questions that have come up. Well, let's talk about that because we've all covered presidential events. We know sure. that if you're in the perimeter, you get wanted. There's a magnetometer. Right. You cannot bring a weapon into the event. We've learned that this took place, this shooting, outside the security perimeter, right. which raises the question, why is a rooftop so close to the president outside any security perimeter? Sure, approximately 150 yards uh, away from it. Uh, they did have the counter sniper teams up there. The, those are the ones that apparently took this individual out. Yes, to your point, you see this building, and it's not directly head on from where Trump was standing. It's off to his right, if you're looking at him, uh, as we've been looking at the video here. And so 150 yards away, elevated surface, talk about a roof of a building, should there have been law enforcement there just to keep an eye on that facility? Should there have been law enforcement that was looking at it? Should that have been part of the perimeter? To your point, I think, Savannah, these are all big questions that need to be asked. And given that this has now occurred, I think there's a real concern in law enforcement. Are other people going to think, you know what, if that guy could do it, maybe I could do it, maybe I could do it even better. And that's a major concern going forward. Yeah, it was in the grounds of a farm show. There actually weren't that many structures nearby. So you'd think they would check out whatever buildings were there. Typically, Tom, even if it is outside the perimeter, if there's an elevated position during a presidential or a candidate's event, a nominee's event, soon to be, um, what is the protocol? Do they just sort of stand guard outside the building? Do they clear those rooftops? What do they normally do? All of that. I mean, I remember it, it's so clear in my mind as this was happening last night. I remember on the anniversary of September 11th when then presidential candidates McCain and Obama traveled to Ground Zero. I was there up on the roofs standing next to me. I still have pictures of it. Uh, you had Secret Service personnel with binoculars. You had counter sniper teams. If anybody opened a window in that in that area, you knew that they were going to be on top of it and scanning for it. So that is one of the things I think that's raising so many questions. And then I think they're going to have to ask, should we have just at least have had some sort of a uniform presence? And that might be what you see going forward, a much stronger uniform presence. In the backdrop of that, law enforcement, and they rely on local law enforcement for this, certainly stretch from a resources standpoint. You look at some of the conventions coming up and you look at the law enforcement situations in those cities, uh, they are short staffed. And they're asking a lot of these individuals to go out there and protect these events. So and it's a big concern. And there's always a tension, Willie, of course, because politicians, they want to get out there. They want to have these rallies. They want to be close up. And from a security perspective, mm -hmm. that's a nightmare. So they're always trying to temper that. Yeah, I'm sure a thorough review, as you say, being undertaken now for events going forward for, for both candidates. Thank Tom you, Winter, Tom. thank you. And we are joined now by the Republican Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson. Mr. Speaker, good morning to you. Good morning. Sir, have you had a chance to speak with the former president since this happened and, and just share your thoughts as we gather here on a, a, just a stunning morning? It is. America awakens to a rather surreal morning. This is a horrific act of political violence that ought to be roundly condemned. Uh, obviously, we, we can't go on like this as a society. Um, you know, our prayers are with President Trump, all the rally attendees, certainly the family of the individual that lost their life and those who were injured. Uh, we uh, have gotten briefings from uh, law enforcement. I spoke to Secretary Mayorkas last night and asked him some pointed questions with regard to Homeland Security and what happened there. I've already Already announced that Congress will do a full investigation of the tragedy yesterday to determine where there were lapses in security and anything else that the American people need to know and deserve to know. But in the meantime, uh, we've got to turn the rhetoric down. We've got to turn the temperature down in this country. We need leaders of all parties on both sides. To
to call that out and make sure that happens so that we can go forward and, and maintain our free society that we all are blessed to have. Amen to that. Speaker Johnson, good morning. Once we learned that the president was okay, thank goodness he was injured but safe. And once you had that information, I wonder what your first thoughts were when you saw the president get up, pump his fist. What were you thinking? Well, it was a show of strength. I mean, I've spent a lot of time with President Trump. I sent him a text immediately. I knew that he wouldn't see it for some time. But to just tell him that, it, obviously, we all saw what seems to be a miracle. I mean, I, I believe that God spared him. And that bullet went just apparently a millimeter from um, doing real and permanent damage to him or perhaps taking his life. And uh, it's just kind of a, a surreal thing. But I, I know him well. He has a, an inexhaustible reservoir of energy and strength. It's almost inexplicable to us sometimes. Uh, but he'll keep fighting, and he should. And look, th Willie, this, this is an important point to make. I, I saw the you were showing some of the text messages of my colleagues in the Senate, the House. Um, they pointed out that the rhetoric has just been over the top. It really has. I mean, there, there's no figure in American history, at least in the modern era, maybe since Lincoln, who's been so vilified and, and, and really persecuted by media and, you know, Hollywood elites, uh, political figures, you know, even the legal system. And when, when the message goes out constantly that the election of Donald Trump would be a threat to democracy and that the republic would end, I mean, it, it heats up the environment. We cannot do that. It's simply not true. Everyone needs to turn the rhetoric down. Agreed. And what is your message? Because you talked about some of the rhetoric that is uh, focused on Donald Trump. We don't have, we could give you many examples, of course, of rhetoric very incendiary against President Biden. There's now concern. And I wonder what your concern is about what happens next and whether or not some of the president's, former president's supporters may want to engage in some kind of retaliation. How concerned are you just for the political environment as you call for both sides to calm down? Well, uh, it, it is a heated political environment on both sides, as you noted. When I came to Congress in January 2017, I, I came to Washington the same time President Trump did. Uh, my colleagues and I, a handful of us, started a, a group we called the Honor and Civility Caucus. The idea being that, look, we can disagree, but we have to do it in an agreeable manner. You know, we don't hate people inside the building. Um, you have political opposition and political opponents, but we're all Americans, and we have to treat one another with dignity and respect. We, we can have um, heated political discourse and debates, but it shouldn't be personal and we shouldn't be targeting people. I mean, look, President Biden himself said in recent days, it's time to put a, a, a bullseye on, on Trump. I mean, I, I know that he didn't mean what is being implied there, but that kind of language on either side um, should be called out. And, and we have to make clear that, that this is part of our system. We can have vigorous debate, but it needs to end there. Mr. Speaker, you mentioned the investigation you called for almost immediately last night into what exactly happened last night. I think everybody wants some answers about how a man was able to get in an elevated position 150 yards from the former president of the United States and take these shots and, as you said, kill someone and injure two others in addition to the president. What answers will you be looking for in that investigation? Well, some are obvious. I mean, uh, I asked. Secretary Mayorkas last night, my first question is, were, was drone, were drones being used in the vicinity? I mean, that would be an obvious thing. You would be able to spot someone on a roof. Um, he didn't know when I asked him that question last night. I'm, and that doesn't mean it didn't happen, but he didn't know last night. Um, uh, we need to know how could uh, an individual be at that elevation that was seen by apparently bystanders on the ground? Yeah. How could not that not be noticed by, uh, by Secret Service? I, Lots more questions and answers this morning. Speaker Mike Johnson, we will continue to follow it, of course. Thank you for spending some time with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't miss the Today Show every weekday at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 Pacific, on our streaming channel, Today All Day. To watch, head to today.com slash all day or click the link right here.